Welcome to Policy on Demand. I'm Cindy Bloom. Today is January 16th, and we're going to start with the tax deal that was announced Tuesday morning. Joining me to get into all the details is Scott McCandless. Scott, welcome. Thank you, Cindy. Good to be with you. So, Scott, what can you tell us about this tax deal? So we had anticipated that we might be hearing a deal perhaps last week, turns out it's this week, and it's announced from the chairman of the tax rating committees in both the House and the Senate. So Chairman Jason Smith of the Ways and Means Committee, Chairman Ron Wyden from the Senate Finance Committee jointly announced this deal. And in substance, it's very similar to what we've been expecting for some time, but it's actually even a little more expansive than that. So the deal does include the three key Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, or TCJA, provisions that we've long been anticipating. The research expense provision under 164, a fix to the interest deduction limitation under 163J, and bonus depreciation. Now, there are some nuances here for the interest deduction limitation and for bonus depreciation. It essentially cures those retroactively as if no change had ever occurred. So, for instance, with bonus depreciation, you go back to full 100% expensing. With the research expense fix, it's a little more nuanced than that. It looks like what they're going to do is fix retroactively the Section 174 research expense issue for domestic incurred expenses, but for foreign incurred expenses that might otherwise qualify, uh, they will continue to have the 15-year amortization period that they have under the 2017 law. So that's a slight change, although we had heard some rumors about that last week that now does, in fact, seem to be the case. Those three so-called business extender provisions will be one part of the package, balanced by some other issues that Democrats have long been requesting for an expansion of the child tax credit. Now, both of these are balanced, as I said, and they're balanced not only in terms of the issues that Republicans and Democrats want, but also in terms of revenue. They come out to roughly $33 billion in revenue each, uh, giving us a total size of the package, a little over $60 billion, but that is paid for uh, in full by pulling back some of the employee retention tax credits that had been instituted during the pandemic. Essentially, they will be turned off as of the end of this month. So that's important to note. If anyone still has some filings that they'd like to make, it needs to be done before the end of January 2024, or it will be turned off. Now, I had mentioned that this bill is also a little more expansive than it had been in the past. So it's not just those business tax extenders and the uh, child tax provisions paid for by this uh, clawback, like I had just mentioned. It also includes some other provisions, including a slight expansion of low-income housing tax credits, uh, some uh, slightly more generous provisions uh, around 1099A, uh, 1099 reporting, uh, increasing the threshold from $600 to $1,000. Uh, and, uh, and that package is what will now uh, come to the floor of the House. But first, it has to go through the Ways and Means Committee, and we could see a markup on that as early as later this week. And Scott, there's been a lot of uncertainty as to the process of how to get a tax deal to enactment. What does the procedural path look like? Sure, it's a great question. And even though we have uh, some excitement about the fact that a deal has been announced, it's still a long way from enactment. Uh, as I mentioned or started to mention, we do see a pathway beginning as early as late this week when the House Ways and Means Committee is expected to mark up this package. It's conceivable there may be some more changes to it then, but uh, it's unlikely as we're, we're going to have to shepherd it through that committee process. Then the real fireworks begin because it will be a big question as to whether and when Speaker Johnson in the House wants to actually put this on the House floor. First of all, the House is due to go out next week. They're not supposed to be in session. So it'll have to be the following week before the House could even put it on the floor. And then it will be an open question as to whether it will go through a usual floor process or use this technique that we've started to see a little bit more uh, recently in the form of the suspension calendar, where you can bypass the Rules Committee and go directly to the floor. That's something that Speaker Johnson has at least contemplated. However, as we know, there are other issues, uh, perhaps larger in Speaker Johnson's mind than the tax issue itself, dealing with overall spending. And it's an open question as, the, as to the extent to which Speaker Johnson might want to use some of his political capital, diverting it from the spending debate and moving it on to the tax debate. So that's a big open question. But even assuming that it does successfully get through the Ways and Means Committee and does successfully get through the floor, if not, uh, if not the week after next, then it has another perilous journey through the Senate. Now, there are a couple of options here. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a deal that was announced by the Republican House Ways and Means Committee Chairman and the Democratic Senate Finance Committee Chairman. Notably absent are some of the other members, such as the Democratic Ranking Member of the Ways and Means Committee and the Republican Ranking Member of the Senate Finance Committee. So especially in the Senate, that absence could be acute because Senate Republicans seem to have been less engaged in putting this package together. That might mean that there's some recalcitrance on their part to move forward in the Senate, meaning that leader Chuck Schumer, Democratic leader of the Senate, 
will have a few options. He could either simply take the bill up and try to put it through on cloture. Uh, he could delay taking it up. Or he could ask for further negotiations. So there is still a very wide decision tree yet to be uh, considered in the Senate. So first and foremost, it has to get through the Ways and Means Committee. We'll focus on that first, and that should happen as late as the end of this week. Then we'll see what happens in two weeks when the House returns, whether they can get it on the floor. And meanwhile, congressional leaders appear to have reached a high-level agreement on a temporary spending measure. What all is included in this agreement? Sure. We finally seem to have some agreement that we need another temporary spending measure in order to get us over the hump. So we have uh, a one uh, measure, one continuing resolution expiring uh, later this week, uh, the end of the day on January 19th, and then the second on February 2nd. Uh, and it seems as they are finally recognizing that negotiations to get a larger spending deal, deal can't get done ahead of these deadlines, especially the one later this week. So they're now contemplating yet another temporary spending measure to buy themselves time in the hopes that they can still do a more fulsome spending bill. Uh, it looks like they will have a couple of CRs now, uh, again, CR standing for continuing resolution, one that will push some of the provisions that were supposed to expire later this week to March 1st, then the ones dealing with the February 2nd deadline, pushing that to March 8th. That's what's on the table right now. Uh, it doesn't necessarily affect the overall spending levels, just make sure that they buy themselves time to continue negotiations. Uh, but even that is going to be hard enough. So this is a big lift because Speaker Johnson said he didn't want to consider yet another continuing resolution. Looks like they're going to have to just because the clock is running out. All right, let's get into some logistics. What factors would need to come together for the spending measure to move forward? Sure, it's interesting that we kind of describe this as a bipartisan deal, which it is as it stands now. But the irony of a bipartisan deal is that it sometimes makes it less palatable to the more partisan elements of both parties. So you might see uh, some of the folks, especially on the Republican side, with their very narrow two-seat majority that they currently enjoy in the House, coming forward and saying, no, 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 we don't want this deal. A continuing resolution that pushes us to march is just asking for a larger omnibus deal that they have considered anathema that they don't want to do. Uh, we'll have to see uh, where some of their pronouncements are, but it's the unfortunate irony of the polarized times in which we find ourselves that sometimes the announcement of the deal can start to unravel that very deal as we see some of the very narrow threads on either side start to pull it apart. So uh, hopefully that won't happen uh, because it, otherwise we would be facing a shutdown later, as soon as later this week, at least for the small portion of the government that is only funded until later this week. Uh, but it looks like they will try to find a pathway to vote on this perhaps as early as this afternoon, uh, Tuesday afternoon in the Senate, uh, and then try to get the House to act as well. Scott, thanks for all those details. And I miss having this conversation with you in person, but next time we will. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. And for our viewers, you'll find a link to an announcement of the tax deal, including information on its details in the description of this episode, as well as an insight. Also included is a link to the latest Week in Review with Chairman Dave Camp, as well as our special episode on PwC's 2024 tax policy outlook. Finally, later this week, we kick off this presidential election year with the first episode of Election Watch, analyzing the Iowa Republican Caucus, what it means, and what's next. We appreciate you spending this time with us and we'll see you next time. Take care.